Welcome to this introductory course. We call it Business and Society to highlight the fact that all of us are in this together. This is Professor Jim Hazy, and I'll be your instructor. The purpose of this course is to explore ways that business concerns and practices and the concerns of society intersect and impact one another. The first module begins part one of this overview course. This first part of the course, called the business environment, consists of three modules which are intended to provide a big picture overview of how the business and social environments work together to create the potential for prosperity. This very first module, the dynamics of business and economics, presents the basics. It is intended to let you see the big picture about what you need to know before we dive more deeply into all of the parts of the business, of a business. Let's get started. We begin module one, the business, the dynamics of business and the economics by asking the question, what drives business in society? Is business good for us, for society in general? Does it help each of us as individuals and as citizens? Or does it hold us down and repress us in some way? Is, there, is it fair? Could it be more fair? Let's now start with the basics. A business is defined as individuals or organizations of various types, each of which tries to earn a profit by providing products and services that satisfy people's needs. The outcome of the internal efforts of an organization of a business are products or services that have both tangible and intangible characteristics that provide satisfaction for those who have them and use them and benefits to those who have them and use them. When one purchases a product and one is buying one is essentially buying the benefits and the satisfaction that one thinks the product will provide. Let's take an example of a Subway sandwich. We may purchase this to satisfy our hunger, but also the particulars of the purchase, the, your favorite sandwich, the way it's made to order, the way you like it, the kind of bread you like, the different kinds of topics, how much you want, all of these are satisfying some specific need people, some of the specific needs that you're looking for, that people are looking for. So there's the hunger, but there's also the specificity of what it is that you like. At Subway, you're really buying both a product, a sandwich, and the service of getting it done the way you want it to be done as the output of the business, the products of the business. Most people associate the word product with a tangible good, an automobile, a computer, a phone, a coat, some other tangible items. However, a product can also be a service. This occurs when people or some machines or equipment of some kind provide something of value to customers. Examples of service might be dry cleaning, having a physical with your doctor, the performance of a basketball team, musical concert. A product can also be an idea. Accountants and attorneys, for example, generate ideas for solving problems. The primary goal of all businesses is to earn a profit. The concept of profit is central to all business activity and it's absolutely key to understand what drives business and the broader economy. Keep this very important concept in mind throughout this course. We define profit quite simply as the difference between what it costs to make and sell a product and what the customer pays for it, the price. Thus, the goal is to produce and sell a product at a price to the customer that the consumer is willing to pay, but that is above what it costs to make and sell it. So if a product costs $8 to produce and it's sold for $10, then $2 is the profit. Earning profits contribute to society 
by in providing employment to people that are in the organization because there's extra money, which in turn, this profit and employment provides money to the workers that is reinvested into the economy. In addition, profits can be earned or must be earned in some sort of responsible manner in a way that supports the society. This is where when we talk a little bit more about the overall economy and whether it's pure free market economy or some sort of mixed economy, sometimes you might need regulations to make sure that profits are being earned in this responsible manner. Not all organizations, however, exist to make a profit. Nonprofit organizations provide goods and services, but do not have the fundamental purpose of earning a profit. Like businesses, nonprofit organizations engage in various functions like management and marketing and finance activities to reach their goals. Examples of nonprofits would be like Goodwill, Goodwill Industries, the Red Cross, Special Olympics. There are many others. You might want to think about some that you might, might come to mind, for example. To earn a profit, a person or an organization needs certain management skills, that is how to plan and organize, control the activities of the business, and find and develop new employees so that it can make the products that the consumers will pay for and keep making them and improving them so continue, consumers continue to buy them. A business also needs marketing expertise to learn what products consumers need and want to develop and manufacture them to come up with the right price to promote them, distribute them, all of those things. In addition to that, of course, business needs financial resources, it needs to find money, it needs to be able to invest it wisely in order to be able to maintain and expand its operations. Other challenges for business people include abiding by the laws and the government regulations, acting in an ethical and socially responsible manner so that the organization, the company, the business is a good corporate citizen, and adapting to economic, political, and social changes. Stakeholders are groups of individuals or organizations that have a stake in the success and outcomes of a business. To achieve and maintain profitability, businesses often find that they have to produce quality products, they have to operate efficiently and be socially responsible and ethical when dealing with their customers, their employees, their investors, government regulators, and the community. All of these are stakeholders in the business. The business itself operates for its investors. It operates to help to help provide employees with wages. It supports the community. Investors make returns. Government regulators make sure that they're complying with all the necessary laws and regulations. These are the various stakeholders that are important to business operations. Concerns about landfills, for example, for, and particularly with high tech uh, equipment, which has many heavy metals that take a long time to be reintroduced into the environment, uh, was concerns that there would be, become graveyards of these various products and, ef and effectively cause a long-term environmental challenge. Sprint became the first wireless company to institute a buyback program that encouraged customers to turn in their mobile devices in exchange for $300 in credit. The company cleans and updates the devices and sells them as refurbished phones at a lower cost. And this reached developing markets because these devices are in higher demand. They may be older, but in certain developing markets, they're still a prized possession. They're usable um, in those economies. And those that are unusable, for example, once they become old or broken, they can be sent to third parties for recycling. The Sprint program was the first of its kind, and it, is, uh, it won the uh, recognition of the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, about essentially being a very good corporate citizen. Um, that's a good thing for, uh, for Sprint. 
but it shows that increasingly, particularly with so much social media and the like, it's important that organizations present themselves to the public in ways that show that they are concerned with the same things their customers are concerned with. That's the notion of social responsibility, which we'll talk about actually in module two. But in this module, module one, which is the overview, in the next, this is the final piece of this first lecture, but in the next lecture, we'll talk a little more detail, in a little more detail about the various components of the business. In this lecture, let's dive a little deeper and look at the components of a business and how the business operates. This figure represents an overview of the business world. Note that owners, employees, and, in, and customers are the main stakeholders, and they're located in the center of the figure. As you move outward, you will see the functions of the business organization, such as finance, marketing, management, then the external social and political environment in which the business operates. The external environment consists of competition, the economy, general economy, different kinds of technology, in particular information technology and how that is changing and operating, legal and political forces and social responsibility. All of these factors have an impact on the daily operations of the business. As you saw in the previous figure, management and employees are in the same segment of the circle. This is because management involves coordinating employees' actions to achieve an organization, a firm's goals, organizing people to work efficiently, and then motivating them to achieve the business goals. This, in sum, is what management is about, organizing people. But it's also concerned with acquiring and developing and using resources, including the people, human resources, and their interconnections, which is called social capital, human capital and social capital, using that and organizing that effectively and efficiently. Production and manufacturing is another element, the two together, the operations, is another element of business manager's plan have to organize and staff and control the tasks that are required to carry out all of this work in the company. These responsibilities are carried out by management in both profit and for profit, I mean, excuse me, for profit and non-profit organizations. For profit is a clear motivation, which is driving profit. Non-profit, generally, there's a service element associated with organizing all of this activity. Market is a very important function in the business. It's focused on understanding customer needs and satisfying them. Marketing includes all activities that are designed to provide those goods to the customers and services that satisfy the customer's needs and wants. Marketers gather information and conduct research to determine what customers are looking for, what they want, not only now, but in future product offerings. Using information gathered from marketing research, marketers plan and develop products and make decisions about how much to charge for their products and when and where to make them available to customers. They also analyze the market environment to see if products need to be modified, changed, or improved in some way. Marketers use promotion, that is advertising, personal selling, sales, coupons, games, sweepstakes, that sort of thing, movie tie-ins, and publicity to communicate the benefits and advantage, advantages of their products as they present them to consumers and in what is a way as a means to increase sales. Sales can be increased in two ways. You could either sell more of a product or you can sell the same number of amount of product but with a greater price. Promotion can imp impact the unit sales, how many you sell, but also the price that you're able to achieve within the marketplace. Although management and marketing 
have to deal with financial concerns, considerations, how much they spend, their budgets and the like. It's the primary responsibility of the owners of the company, the shareholders and managers associated with that support to provide the financial resources for the operations of the business. Finance refers to all the activities concerned with obtaining money and using that money effectively, cost effectively, within the organization. People who work there are often accountants, it could be stockbrokers who are investing money, investment advisors, and bankers. They're all part of what's called the financial world or the financial services industry, uh, but they're supporting a particular organization or customer. Owners sometimes borrow money to get, their, get started with the business. They do that from bankers or potentially in private investors, or they might at attract them as partners or as stockholders of the company. Now that we know the basics of business, in the next lecture, lecture, we'll talk briefly about why we want to study business and how it works, how it can help us as citizens and potentially help us understand the kinds of jobs that we might want to get. Let's talk briefly about why we study business. We have seen the various functions and aspect of a business. It's important to ask why it's important for us as students to understand business. Why do we study business? What's, what, can, what can an understanding or a better understanding of the business environment do to help us? In particular, why is it important to understand how business and society interact with one another? Studying business can help develop certain skills about how to operate, how to work within the economy, and acquire knowledge that might prepare us for a future career, for example. And this is regardless of whether you end up working for a multinational Fortune 500 firm, start your own business, work for a government agency, manage or be a volunteer for a nonprofit. Business drives economic activity. So like it or not, it's important to understand how it operates. The economy in general provides the flow or manages the flow of economic resources. These are done through business. So understanding how that all works is important. The field of business offers a variety of challenging and interesting opportunities for careers. This is in the US throughout the world, such as marketing, human resource management, information technology, finance, production, operations, wholesaling and retailing, purchasing, many and many other business opportunities. Studying business can also help better understand how many of the business activities that are necessary to support commerce, transportation, all of the various services that we expect within our economic and political environment. Each and every one of these activities carries a price. It costs money to deliver it. How does one allocate resources to these things? That's the question that we are studying when we study a business course, particularly one that talks about business and its interaction with society. Studying business can help us understand and become well-informed consumers and can become contributing members of society. Business activities generate profits that are essential not only to the businesses themselves and the local economies in which they operate, but also to the health of the national and global economy. Understanding how our particular free enterprise economic system works and how it allocates resources and provides incentives for industry and for the workplace is really important for everyone. This is an example of how one individual entrepreneur developed over time and how that supports the economy, not just the business economy, not just the business environment, but also the social environment. Look at Bill Daniels. He founded Cablevision. It was the first cable TV system started in Casper, Wyoming in 1953. It's now con he's now considered to be one of the fathers of the cable television industry. Prior to Daniels, before he died, but prior, prior to when he died in 2000, he not only he not only started the company and built up Cablevision, but he also 
established a a fund a, a, a foundation of about 1.1 billion dollars that supports a diversity of causes from education to business ethics during his career he created the young americans bank where children could create bank accounts and learn about financial responsibility this remains one of the world's only charter banks for young people he also created the Daniels College of Business through a donation of $20 million to the University of Denver. During his life, he affected many people and organizations beyond his business contacts, but also within his philanthropy. Uh, he left a legacy of giving and impacting communities throughout the United States. Business and those who participate in it. Um, another example we see now is Bill Gates making uh, investments in healthcare and other areas around the world. Uh, no matter, those who participate in it can have a tremendous impact on society. In the next lecture, we'll begin to explore the importance of economics as the foundation for business, how some general concepts about economics and how it works. So it explains how we develop resources and utilize resources across our national economy and in fact the global economy. It's important not only for business but it out, act, a better understanding will help us understand how we can achieve greater prosperity in general. In this lecture we'll look more closely at the economic foundations for business. We define economics as the study of how resources are distributed for the production of goods and services within a social system. We use the term resources to refer to natural resources, human resources, financial resources, and intangible resources. Natural resources are land, forest, minerals, water, and other things made by people not made by people. Human resources are the physical and the mental abilities people that use to produce their goods and services. It's also called labor, sometimes knowledge workers. Financial resources are the funds used to acquire the natural and human resources needed to provide products. This is also called capital. Because human because natural, human, and financial resources are used to produce goods and services, they are sometimes called factors of production. The firm can also have intangible resources, such as a good reputation for quality products or being socially responsible. The goal is to turn the factors of production and the firm's intangible resources into competitive advantage. Now that we have some basic difference in the next lecture, basic definitions, in the next lecture, we'll look at the major economic systems that we can find in different economies around the world, including the free market capitalism, free market capitalism, free enterprise system. We'll do that in the next lecture. In this lecture, we'll look at the major economic systems that are used by different countries. The choice that the country makes determines how that society will distribute its resources. An economic system describes how a particular society has chosen to distribute its resources to produce goods and services for organizations and for people. A central issue in economics is how to fulfill what is, um, what is assumed to be an unlimited demand for goods and services in a world with limited supply of resources. Although economic systems handle the distribution of resources in different ways, all economic systems must address three important issues. Number one, what goods and services and how much of each of these will satisfy customer needs? Number two, how will goods and services be produced who will produce them, and with what resources will they be produced? And number three, how are the goods and services being, uh, how are the goods and services going to be distributed among the various consumers or organizations that purchase goods and services in the economy? Those are the three main questions and economic system answers. 
let's look at these three types of economies one by one. Communism was first described by Karl Marx as a society in which the people, without regard to class, own all of the nation's resources. Everybody owns them together. Today, there are a few countries that are considered to be communistic, but there are no true communist economies that exist today that satisfy this ideal that Marx put on paper. The communist communism appears to be efficient and equitable on paper, producing less of a gap between rich and poor. In practice, however, communist economies have been marked by low standards of living, critical shortage of consumer goods, high prices, of, high prices corruption, and individual freedoms tend to be curtailed. Some of these societies would include China and Cuba. In other words, the desire to distribute resources efficiently so people can be motivated and, uh, and achieve their own personal objectives, all of those seem to be less than optimally supported within this communist structure, economic structure. Socialism is an economic system in which the government owns and operates basic industries, like, for example, postal service, telephone system, utilities, transportation, health care, banking, some manufacturing. But individuals own most other businesses like uh, restaurants, uh, beauty parlors, uh, those kinds of, uh, of operations. Um, most socialist nations are democratic and they recognize basic, basic individual freedoms. Social e economies generally uh, profess a kind of egalitarianism, whereas equal distribution of income and social services trying to reduce cat class differences. They believe that economies are more stable than those with other, of other nations. That is, the, the, the socialist that keeps their, their, their country uh, more stable. Although this may be true, taxes and unemployment are generally high in socialist countries. Um, examples of some that we uh, that are existing today are Sweden, Israel, and India. Uh, various companies where the uh, government owns like these big industries, as and and, and operates these big industries, um, as we described. Capitalism or free enterprise is an economic system in which individuals own and operate the majority of businesses that provide goods and services. Competition, supply and demand, uh, these are the things that determine which goods and services are, are produced, how they are produced, and how they are distributed. Some of the company, countries that are in this category include Australia and Canada, as well as uh, the, the comp uh, countries like United States and Japan, uh, free market capitalism. Um, there are really two kinds of capitalism. As I was saying before, this sort of a free market capitalist system is one that is basically unconstrained and the modified capitalism. Uh, stepping back again, in pure capitalism, that is the quote free market system, all of the economic decisions are made without government intervention. This was described by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, he's the father of capitalism who said that the invisible hand of competition best regulates the economy. Uh, this is called laissez-faire capitalism. I mean, let it be laissez-faire, let it be. In other words, keep your hands off of it, just let it run and somehow this invisible hand will allocate resources effectively. And we'll talk a lot more about this uh, particular assumption and what it really means as we go forward. But that this implies the government should not interfere because interference by government with regulations would always create some sort of a friction in this uh, otherwise efficient capital or efficient market system. Um, and, and we'll talk more about how realistic such an assumption is. Modified capitalism differs from pure capitalism in that the government intervenes and regulates business to some extent. One of the ways in which the United States and Canada governments regulate their business is through some of their laws. Mixed economies is where countries 
use some of different elements of various economies in order to construct sort of a customized presentation of their economic system. In fact, no country really practices any, a pure form of any of these, communism, socialism, or capitalism. Although most tend to favor one system over others, most nations operate as mixed economies with elements of all three of these in or not all three of them or at least one of the one other system as well as the main economic system that they have incorporated in socialist sweden for example most businesses are owned and operated by private individuals however in capitalist united states uh, there's an independent federal agency that operates the Postal Service, and as we most of us know, most of the transit systems in cities and, um, and regions in the United States is also run by, uh, by government agencies. Countries such as China and Russia use state capitalism to advance their economy. Uh, state capitalism integrates the power of the state with the advantages of capitalism. It's also led by the government some of these businesses are led by the government, but they use capitalist tools such as they might list state-owned enterprises, companies on a stock market, and they would embrace capital uh, globalization in terms of trade, etc. Um, even though there's a state-owned business that is being uh, having having many of its decisions supported by or not by uh, supported by supported or not by capital markets, which would help give them some direction about where they should take their organizations going forward. So many of these economies are come together in ways that allow different aspects of the, the different three, three main economic systems to be utilized to optimize their, their own national economy. Modified capitalism differs from pure capitalism in that the government intervenes in the markets and regulates businesses to some extent. One of the ways in which the United States and Canadian governments regulate businesses, business is through laws. Laws such as the Federal Trade Commission Act was created by, created this organization called the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, to enforce antitrust laws. That makes, make, not make sure companies don't get too large and ensure competition. It's also the, the Food and Drug Administration and various kinds of administrations that look into market exchanges and try to limit or limit the sorts of extreme behaviors that markets might sometimes have. Um, this illustrates the importance of some level of government in the economy. So the, the general argument isn't if the government intervenes, but it's more how and to what degree does government intervention in, to, to help uh, help improve market performance, not in terms of value, but in terms of what resources are delivered to whom, safety concerns and the like, uh, how much of that versus when is it too much? And that's where the disagreement in the political system um, most often occurs. The f many economies, including the United States and Canada and Japan, are based on free enterprise, this underlying free enterprise system, different a little bit than free markets where you stay out of the markets. Free enterprise means you grant personal freedoms to businesses and individuals. Uh, many communist and socialist countries such as China are China and Russia are starting to apply more principles from free enterprise to their own economic systems. Essentially free enterprise allows a company to succeed or fail based upon market demand. That is, if they sell more, they survive. If they sell less, they don't survive. Companies can efficiently manufacture and sell consumers, sell products to consumers, whatever they desire. They'll probably succeed, but those companies that don't manage to do that will probably fail. An entrepreneur presents his idea for a new product Entrepreneurs are more productive in a free enterprise system because they can make choices about what to provide and therefore they can innovate and really change the dynamics of the marketplace. A number of basic individual rights must exist for free enterprise to work. 
These rights are the goals of countries that have embraced free enterprise. Organizations or structures try to be put into place that support these objectives. Number one, individuals have to have the right to own property and pass this property on to heirs. That the right, this right motivates people to work hard during their lifetimes to save, to buy things and develop them over time. A motivation to grow your own nest egg, if you will. Individuals and businesses must have the right to earn profits and then use those profits as they wish. With, this is, of course, within the constraints of the society's laws and principles. And this is where the notion of how much taxation do you need, do you apply? If there's too much taxation, you start to limit this notion of individuals being able to use the profits the way they want to. Individuals and businesses must, have, must be able to make their own decisions, how they want to decide what, how, what, how to use their resources and how to determine how their business should operate. Although there's government regulation, the philosophy in countries like the United States and Australia is to minimize regulation and maximize the individual freedom within a set of rules of fairness that the society agrees are necessary to hold their so social fabric together. Number four, individuals must choose uh, must have the right to choose the career they like to pursue, where they want to live, what goods and services to purchase, and more. This is what allows free markets to work because people can move if they can't get what they need. Um, they can choose to purchase things or not, which helps drive more efficient pricing depending upon what they need. So the resources get distributed efficiently in the society. Business must have the right to choose where to locate, what goods and services to produce, and what resources to use in the production process, and so on. Without these rights, businesses really can't function effectively as a free enterprise because they're not really motivated to succeed. Thus, these rights, individual and business rights, make possible the open exchange of goods and services and effective pricing which we'll talk about later or in the next couple lectures. In the next lecture, in fact, we'll get more specific about this underlying notion that is in microeconomics of supply and demand and how important that is to driving prices and what prices are really doing for the economy. That'll be in the next lecture. In this lecture, we'll talk about market pricing and how it signals local value. Because people and organizations want and need access to a limited supply of the products and services that other people and organizations either have on hand or have to make, all of these groups and individuals compete for access to a very limited supply, limited number of resources. Bidding among many buyers and sellers among, for different products and services so that everyone could get the best or at least a fair price can be a very inefficient process if you think about it, comparing value from one product to another. To make this process easier across many different product lines, we use an exchange currency that measures, quote, value, unquote. In the United States, we use U.S. dollars to measure this exchange value. The common currency simplifies the bidding process and the exchange process. It's so it's used to balance what is available, which is a supply, with what people want, which is demand, across many, many different product lines. These forces of supply and demand in markets are used to allocate resources in countries like the United States and other free enterprise systems. Supply and demand determines the distribution of resources and products. From your experience, you can probably recognize that consumers are usually willing to buy more of an item if the price gets lower, if it falls, it's on sale, because they want to save money for other goods and services. Demand is the number of goods and services that consumers are willing to buy at, a diff at different prices at a specific time. It's the demand curve. 
And supply is the number or supply curve is the number of products that is goods and services that businesses are willing to sell at different prices at a specific time. In general, because the potential for profits are higher, businesses are willing to supply more of a good or service at a higher price. There's less risk when the price is higher. You can incur a little bit of extra cost if you have to produce more than you might have on hand. You have to go out and buy more, whatever. So suppliers are willing to, do, to create, producers are willing to produce more and supply more if the prices are higher. This is the basic supply and demand. Let's consider an example of handmade rugs. Consumers may be willing to buy six rugs at $350 each, four at $500 each, but only one at $650. The relationship between the price and the number of rugs that consumers are willing to buy can be graphically shown, you can see it here, with a demand curve. A company that sells rugs may be willing to sell six at $650 each, four at $500 each, but just two at $350. The relationship between the price of rugs and the quantity of rugs, the quantity of rugs that the company is willing to supply, willing to sell, is, can be, is shown here as the supply curve. That's the, the red curve on the, on the graph. The supply and demand curves intersect at a point where supply, where people are willing to sell at a price, meets the demand that people have to pay that price. So they're willing to buy that many at that price. So that price creates a balance or an equilibrium that is stable. The price where the number of products the businesses are willing to supply equals the products that businesses are or that consumers are willing to buy is called this equilibrium price. In our rug example, the company is willing to supply four rugs at $500 each, and the consumers are willing to buy four rugs at $500 each. Therefore, $500 is the equilibrium price for a rug at that point in time. Most rug companies will price their rug at $500 with, of course, noise in the system around $500. Think about what a supplier might be willing to supply if, if he would have he could sell four rugs at $500 each, but he would only sell two at $350 each. Wouldn't your initial to intuition be that the seller would either agree to sell or not? What is it? If the seller would make a large enough profit, why not sell more? Think about this. Why does the quantity matter to the seller? If the cost of making the rug goes up, or if the, rug, if the cost to ship the rugs to the store goes up due to changing oil prices, the businesses will not offer as many at the old price. Changing price alters the supply curve, and the new equilibrium price results. This is an ongoing process with supply and demand constantly changing in response to changes in the economic conditions, the availability of resources, the degree of competition. The price of a particular product at a particular moment is a signal to anyone that's in the marketplace about current conditions in the economy. This signal contains very useful information for each of us, for anyone that is willing to interpret it about what is happening in this particular marketplace. You know the relative value of various kinds of commodities and kinds of products, and therefore you can understand how you can better allocate your, your, your capital. Pricing helps allocate resources, and it helps people satisfy their demands by allocating their resources properly among the various products and services that are available. That's the underlying dynamic that is described in this supply and demand curve model. It's equilibrium price. As the prices move, you learn about how you can better allocate your resources. And that goes throughout the economy because it ripples down through the suppliers, what they buy, how much they make, all of those kinds of things. That's the basic logic of the equilibrium prices. So we ask ourselves, 
is this a fair process? Is this a reasonable way to determine for a society who gets what resources? Who gets access to what resources? Certain critics of supply and demand say that the system doesn't really distribute resources equally. If you have more assets, you get more stuff. The forces of supply and demand prevent sellers who have to sell at a higher price because their costs are high. They can't get into the marketplace and buyers who don't have enough money can't afford to buy goods at the equilibrium price. The price is too high now. So they're not participating in the market and they're not necessarily optimizing or maximizing their own uh, value of their environment, what they can achieve in terms of their, their sense of well-being. According to critics, the wealthy can afford to buy more than they need, but the poor may be unable to buy enough of what they need. Is there a better way? I don't know the answer to this, but this is the reason that other economic systems like socialism or communism to some degree, it's, it had been in some points, or at least theory is around it, uh, they're adopted to try and alleviate some of these questions we have about inequality. Perhaps the answer is that supply and demand pricing is fair for luxury goods like vacations, but not so much for basic needs like food staples or public transportation or basic health care. This is the core or one of the core reasons that we have these political debates. It's why the government sometimes steps in to regulate markets. You want to make sure that people get safe transportation and not just transportation. You could get transportation at a lower price, but it might not be safe, those kinds of things. And this is really what most or much of the political debate in our society is all about. In the next uh, lecture, we'll start to talk about marketplace competition and some of the dynamics of that um, and how that affects allocation of resources as well. In this lecture, we'll talk about marketplace competition and how it drives efficiency. Now, one would think that competition should improve the quality of goods and services that are available or reduce the prices of those services. Let's look at Marriott's, Marriott Hotels. It went from a small root beer stand in 1927 to its current status of 3,900 high quality hotels in 72 countries. Marriott believed that if it treated its employees, this was its operating model, if it treated its employees well, they in turn would provide good service to customers that has worked. Marriott has garnered a reputation as a high quality hotel chain and it's now competing to attract younger travelers by changing the way its lobby presents, by providing different amenities, convenient ways. Essentially, it's continuing to adapt and change because it's trying to continue to adapt, to adopt, to attract new customers as customer uh, demands or customer preferences change over time. And it's doing that in competition with other hotels. It's also expanding into Africa and Asia to try and capitalize on market opportunities. It's been ranked as one of the, 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 the uh, leading hotel groups across the world. Competition drives this kind of behavior because in order to succeed, you have to give the customers what they want at a reasonable price. And those are, that's the benefit of a competitive environment. That's the logic of it. So let's look at it a little bit more closely and how that affects the marketplace, the different kinds of competition. Competition is rivalry among businesses for consumer dollars or for dollars from anybody that is purchasing customers, customer dollars, customer value. According to Adam Smith, competition fosters efficiency and low prices by forcing producers to offer the best product at the most reasonable price possible. Those who fail to do so aren't able to stay in business because somebody else will do it. Thus, competition should improve the quality of goods and services available or reduce prices. With a free enterprise system, there are four types of competitive environments. There's pure competition, 
monopolistic competition, oligopy, and monopoly. Pure competition is the market structure that exists when there are many small businesses selling one standardized product. No one business sells enough to produce of the product to influence the market's price because there's so many other players. And because there's no difference in the products, prices are determined solely by the forces of supply and demand. Monopolistic competition is the market structure that exists when there are fewer business than there are in the pure competitive sense in that environment. And the differences among their goods, they, the goods they sell are small, you know, like aspirin, soft drinks, vacuum cleaners. These are examples of goods that are sold in this mon mon monopolistic competitive environment. There's differences in packaging and maybe warranty, whatever, but generally they all satisfy the same consumer needs. An oligopy is a market structure that exists when there are very few businesses selling a product. In an oligopy, individual businesses have control over their product's price because each business supplies a very large portion of the products sold in the marketplace. So it's hard for some consumers to get access to other products other than the ones that I'm selling. Nonetheless, the prices charged by different firms, they still stay fairly close together because one company might, other companies will respond to a price change just to make sure they maintain their larger market share. And the last view is a monopoly in the, the market structure. It's, it's a, where there's only one business providing a product or service. Utility companies that supply electricity, natural gas, water, they're monopolies. The government permits these because they create very efficient access or very efficient uh, distribution of that particular service because oftentimes there's large economies of scale associated with these utilities. Um, but they don't want they, they need to have some sort of a, um, a price control because they do have the only, they're the only uh, office in town, if you will. And so government steps in and takes some control. So here's another case where the question of if you let the market consolidate around a monopoly, then too much price power moves into the organization and the consumers have to essentially pay whatever the price is that's being offered. And so that's one, where, one way where, where markets move in a direction that government is often considered to be, um, to bring, to come in and have some important effect in reducing that negative consequence of that natural market condition. Government granted monopolies therefore also are generally subject to government regulated pricing if they want to stay in business, particularly when it's some necessary thing like water or heat or telecommunications. In the next lecture, we'll step back again and look at the macro economy in which all of these business and their, and their customers live and work. In this lecture, I'll provide a brief overview of the macroeconomic picture, that is the national economy, the international and political economy. The economy is the aggregate of all things that are bought and sold within an organization, within a nation or a state or something like that. As such, they're not stagnant. They expand or they contract. Sometimes people are buying a lot and sometimes they're not feeling so good. Maybe the weather's bad, whatever, and they're not buying things. Therefore, the economy would get smaller. The amount that everyone buys and sells gets smaller. An economic expansion, that is people are buying more and more and more, occurs when an economy is growing and people are spending more money each time period. Their purchases stimulate the production of more goods and services, which in turn stimulates employment. More people are hired. 
this creates a market pressure to increase wages. You're trying to hire more people. You got to incent them to come on board, higher wages, which in turn increases demand and so forth. You get this nice rolling stone building momentum, uh, positive feedback thing that causes this expansion to occur. The standard of living rises because more people are employed and have money to spend, so they buy more goods and services, which drives additional production. Rapid expansions in the economy, however, if this happens too fast, there may be inflation because everyone's trying to buy things, and so prices go up, and that causes a, a rise in prices. Inflation can be harmful if individuals' incomes don't increase at the same rate as the prices of goods and services. I have a certain amount of money, I'm getting raises, but the prices are going up faster, so I end up buying less of what I can, can have. Economic contraction is when things slow down. We call these recessions. Um, it's a slowdown that's characterized by a decline in spending. People start to spend less or businesses produce less and they start laying off workers. This is, this is why contractions can lead to this idea of a recession. Technically, a recession is two consecutive quarters of smalling or contracting um, size of the purchases in the economy, the gross domestic product, which we'll talk about in a minute. A decline in this production and employment and income and all that are some of the characteristics of a recession. These are characterized by, generally we measure them when we worry about unemployment during a recession. Uh, this is the, unemployment is measured as the percent of the population that wants to work but is unable to find a job. So they're out looking for work, but they can't get a job. Rising unemployment levels tend to stifle demand for products and goods because effectively people aren't working and so therefore they're, they don't, uh, they can't, they, they put off purchases until they find themselves getting a job. This might cause downward pressure on prices because less people are making demand. So demand goes down, that would tend to mean prices go down. And this condition is called deflation. It's generally considered a risky situation when price declines can be seen at the macro level, that is the aggregate pricing. Um, deflation is considered a risky situ situation since falling prices can eliminate profits, therefore slow down business expansion, business investment, more layoffs, more, de more decline. It's the reverse situation that you might have when you have a, a strong expansion. Therefore, deflation is considered a risk to the economy. A very, very severe recession then can turn into a depression in which unemployment is very high, consumer spending is low, stays low, and business output is reduced. This can all bring prices down and you have this de deflationary spiral as they call it. Economies expand and contract on a regular basis. It's called the business cycle. And this is in response to changes in the in demands of consumers and businesses, as well as government spending. The government is a significant part of the economy. So when the government is spending money, that reinforces the kind of flywheel effect and continues the economy in its expansion. Although fluctuations in the economy are inevitable, and to a certain extent one can even predict them, their effects, that is inflation, unemployment, they can disrupt, disrupt the lives of individuals involved. The big picture is kind of predictable and normal, but the effects locally to individuals who lose their jobs or communities that lose a factory can be quite significant. And this is why governments try their best to minimize these kinds of uh, these kinds of events. Another important consideration is that inflation can also be harmful if they run out of control in the sense of inflation. If individuals incomes don't increase at the same pace as prices, but prices keep going up, people actually start buying less because prices are higher 
but the prices keep going up because of other, other trends in the economy in terms of the cost of various goods of production. Hyperinflation can be extremely severe. The worst case was in the 19, in Hungary in 1946, where at one point there were doubling of prices every 15.6 hours. And also, in, we hear about in the Weimar Republic, uh, people taking wheelbarrows of cash to buy their products and the price is going up so quickly. Because prices are going up quickly, people want to buy a lot before the price goes up, which drives the price up further. So you have this additional cycle. Um, another bad case was in Zimbabwe, which had hyperinflation so severe that its inflation percentage rate rose into the hundreds of millions whenever they eliminated the Zimbabwean dollar, the put certain price controls, inflation began to decrease, but it can disseminate or actually destroy a country's economy and that's what happened in Zimbabwe. So we have this system of the overall economic system of a country growing or expanding, sometimes slowing down a little bit or even contracting a little bit, but then returning to expansion and the government tries to maintain that support because that's really what drives economic activity, allows taxes to be collected, allows government services to be provided, um, you know, mail and transportation and all those sorts of things. People get their jobs. The economy moving forward is a critical element and, um, and, and it's one of the things that is watched by several different kinds of government agencies. Um, in the next lecture, we'll talk about how one measures all of this so that you get a sense and you can predict what is likely ha what is happening and then what likely will happen in the future. So let's talk about measuring the economy and all this economic activity at the macro level for a country or even globally. Countries measure their economies to determine how, whether the country is, the economy is expanding, and if so, how fast, whether it's contracting, if so, how fast, whether corrective action is necessary to um, mitigate the risk of some of these more serious, like hyperinflation on the one hand, or de deflation on the other hand, um, and try to take some corrective action or interventions. Uh, one of the most commonly used measures is called gross domestic product, or GDP. You'll hear about this all the time. The GDP is the sum of all goods and services produced in a country during a given year. It does not include products or profits from the company's overseas operations. A company, a US-based company that's selling overseas, those profits are not included. But it does include profits earned by foreign countries, foreign companies that are operating within the US. However, when the foreign sales, whenever we measure GDP per capita, that doesn't include these uh, foreign sales in the, in, in the U.S. But it's, a, it's the most important measure that says where the, comp where the economy is, what's the total purchasing um, that's going on within the economy. And hopefully that's continuing to increase, which means that the there are room, there's jobs being developed and, and people are being able, able to work and they're able to get wages and they're able to purchase things. This table here describes some other ways that we evaluate the economy. I'll mention each of these uh, uh, briefly. A trade balance is uh, the difference between the exports and imports for a particular entity, for a particular economy. If the balance is negative, as is for the US, it has been since the mid 80s, it's called a trade deficit. It's generally viewed as un unhealthy in the sense that we're buying more imports than we're selling abroad. So there's a net outflow of capital um, purchasing from foreign entities. Consumer price index is another one. This measures the changes in the prices of goods. It's a basket of goods. It's a measurement of the average kind of things people buy and what the prices of those are and how they go up and down based upon consumption in urban households is the measure. 
per capita income in, uh, indicates the average income level for Americans. Uh, this is useful in determining how much the individual, the average consumer, uh, has to spend, how much money they're earning. The unemployment rate indicates how many working age Americans are not working who would otherwise want to work. That is, they are looking for something to do, but they can't find a job. Americans who don't work in the traditional sense, like house husbands or housewives, they're not accounted for in unemployment because they're not looking for work. They're not looking for a wage earning job. Um, inflation monitors the price increases in consumer goods and services over time. Uh, this is used to determine if the cost of goods and services are going up faster than worker compensa compensation, which could ultimately be a, a challenge because if prices are going up too fast, then people will want to buy something sooner rather than later before the price goes up and this could increase prices and cause this hyperinflation problem we've described before. Um, worker productivity is uh, in the news a lot. Um, it's the amount of goods and services produced for each hour work, each hour of work. Productivity should be increasing because we have much use of machines and knowledge work and computers. So every hour somebody works, there ought to be more goods and services produced. So that's measured closely to see how well we're using these kinds of new technologies and other types of quote productivity enhancing uh, structure that we put in place to um, increase the amount of productivity that an individual worker would would generate. Now it, you, you got to remember this is an aggregate measure that just gives a sense of the output versus the labor force. It doesn't talk about how hard individuals are working or how smart individuals are working. It's more just we can produce this much with this much labor. And so it's a macro measure. Got to re always remember that. It doesn't really say people aren't working hard or whatever. That's not re related to that. It's, it, the word seems to have that connotation, but that's really not what it means. In the next and our last lecture, we'll put all of this together into a historical context. In this last lecture of this first module, this introductory module and the, uh, the first, uh, first lecture of our uh, part one, which is the general overall perspective of business, we'll offer a little bit of historic context about the U.S. economic system. The United States is a mixed economy with a foundation based on capitalism. To understand the current state of the American economy and its effect on business practices, it's helpful to examine its history and the role that an entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial principles and entrepreneurism has on, on the economy and how the government interacts with the economy. Before the colonization of North America, of course, uh, Native Americans lived in a, a what's essentially a hunter-gatherer kind of model in farming. Uh, there was some trade among farm, uh, some trade among various tribes, but by and large, it was hunter-gathering and and, um, and and an agricultural model. The colonists who came uh, after the uh, after uh, the 1600s, um, they operated primarily an agricultural economy. But as the nation expanded towards the West, they found natural resources like coal, copper, iron ore, and they used them to produce various goods like horseshoes, farm implements, kitchen utensils, and of course, some trade developed around those, um, those inventions. Some families also spent time turning materials, raw materials into clothing, household goods, you know, with cotton, the skins, and that sort of thing, wool. Because these goods were produced at home, this system is called the domestic system. In the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution brought the development of new technologies in factories. The factory brought together all the resources needed to make a product, materials, machines, workers. Then we had railroads. They brought major changes, allowing farmers to send their goods and surplus crops and goods all over the nation and barter them for sale. Markets started to develop. Factories began to spring up along the railway, along the railways 
to manufacture farm equipment and a variety of other goods that were shipped along the rails. Industrialization brought significant increase to the prosperity in the United States and it, the U.S. gradually became a manufacturing economy. That's one that's devoted to producing goods and providing services rather than just producing agricultural products, uh, food goods and the like. Businesses began, became more concerned with the needs of the consumer and once you have a lot of factory capacity, you're producing more perhaps than consumers would just buy just because they've never seen this before and they really want it. Now they choose between different products. And that's when the U.S. entered into what's called a marketing economy because these uh, develops occurred in this free market system, free enterprise system, where the consumers were determining which goods and services they wanted to buy. And so they, for, therefore, their preferences and the markets and the pricing determined which goods and services were produced. They did this by purchasing the products they like at the prices they were willing to pay. So that was using the pricing system as a signal to manufacturers about what to make, how much to make of various products and services, depending upon what people were willing to buy and at what prices. So that's the way this information flow through markets is so effective. After World War II, with the increased standard of living, Americans had more money and more time. And so the profile of family was changing. Today, there's uh, many single parent families and individuals living alone and two parent families. Both parents often work. Americans are increasingly paying others to do various kinds of tasks at home, domestic tasks like cooking, laundry, landscaping, and child care. And these trends have gradually changed the United States into what's called a service economy, which is one that is devoted to the production of services that other people can purchase to make life easy for their busy customers. Service industries include such things as restaurants, banking, healthcare, childcare, auto repair, leisure related industries, and even education. These are growing rapidly and they now account for as much as 80% of the US economy. These trends continue with new technologies and they're contributing new service products all the time like Uber and others based upon technologies and digital media that we can provide it instantaneously at our fingertips with smartphones, social networking and virtual worlds. A nice long story of how we got to where we are and things are changing rapidly and continue to change and will continue to change for years to come. It's good to know where you came from to kind of understand where we might be going. In this system, the entrepreneur plays a key role. They're individuals who identify an unmet, need, an unmet, unmet need in the economy and they're willing to take risks. And so they take the risk of their wealth and their time and their effort to try to develop a product or a service that will meet that need. Often, these innovative products or new ways of doing things disrupt the current players in the market and fundamentally change important aspects of the economy. The internet, for example, or Facebook, have changed radically how we interact with one another and how we how we purchase and I, how we learn about new goods and services and purchase them. Then we have drones and virtual reality are, on the, are coming in the, in the future, driverless cars, all sorts of potentially new products and services. Just think about what some ideas, some possibilities that were created with services that, that, were, uh, that model themselves on the Pokemon Go view of creating a virtual view of the world that you're in. Instead of just finding uh, Pokemon characters, you could buy goods and services or identify opportunities you might not see otherwise for having some sort of a leisure or some other kind of a service uh, event in your life, some experience. The free enterprise system provides conditions necessary for entrepreneurs to succeed. In the past, entrepreneurs were often inventors who brought all the factors of production together to produce a new product. 
Um, others were so-called captains of industry invested in the country's growth. Um, now we often have entrepreneurs that are creating new software applications and different virtual environments online, uh, videos on YouTube that are entertainment that provide entertainment to us um, that puts a lot of power for innovation and change in entrepreneurs through social media, media and the virtual environments. Entrepreneurs constantly change the American business practices with these various kinds of technologies and inventions and different management techniques that are also introduced in entrepreneurial activities. Entrepreneurship requires certain abilities and skills. You have to evaluate risk. You have to understand innovation, creativity. And of course, the system itself has to have incentives that will bring them rewards. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, successful, highly successful entrepreneurs. There are many others I'm sure that you can think of. Um, Elon Musk, with, um, who's, who was, was one of the founders and one of the, uh, the entrepreneurs in uh, PayPal and is now developing Tesla and SpaceX and other possible uh, new companies. These are why they're so important. These are very important to a free market economy because it, it is what enables change and adaptation and innovation in the economy. The flip side of the bottom up role of the entrepreneur is the role of government in the economy. The American economy is, as we've described, a modified capitalism. Uh, the government regulates certain businesses. Uh, federal, state, and local governments all intervene in the economy to make sure that the, uh, the products and services that are purchased are, don't undermine the social fabric, if you will. Uh, if you're having some work done around your house, you might have to have a building inspector to make sure the plumbing or the electrical doesn't put it, isn't put in, it's a safety risk because that would incur, not only might the house burn down if it's an electrical problem, but it would incur the fire department has to come in. So the system, the society would have to have a larger emergency services group. So by putting these kinds of regulations, it modifies just this pure um, idea of free market capitalism. They're designed, they should be designed, laws and regulations to promote competition and, and at the same time protecting consumers and employees. And also increasingly realization that there has to be protections on the environment. Other agencies measure the health of the economy. They figure out what's necessary to make steps to minimize disruptive effects of fluctuations and to reduce unemployment and not only reduce unemployment, but provide a safety net for those who are, who do become unemployed. Um, they, uh, the federal, there are other agencies that are, that are put in place, in particular the Federal Reserve Board, which tries to intervene when they understand things are happening in the economy that are creating risk. They try to spur growth by moving money. They call it the money supply. We'll talk more about this at the end of the course. Um, but they in, in, it put money into the economy so people have more money to spend and businesses have more money uh, to hire people, to create demand, and hopefully cause the economy that might be slowing down and moving into a contraction and bring it back up into an expansion just because you have now more money into, in, the, in the system. And that's another uh, important government function that helps move the American economy forward. Um, all of these are uh, important elements of how the government at the macro level supports keeping the system moving forward and some of the things that might move it off the rails, pushing it back onto the rails. In contrast to in our prior, pre, prior discussion, the entrepreneur being the bottom up change agent, kind of like the, the gadfly that's making things change and different the government keeps it all sort of moving in the right direction. And of course, there's a difficult balance there. All of this occurs in the context of 
ethical and social responsibility of businesses in the community. This is the, the middle range organizations that are operating within this government umbrella, under this government umbrella, but also with these entrepreneurs running around among them, the organizations that are currently there. Um, in the past few years, there's been a number of scandals at different kinds of corporations, Enron, Countrywide, British Petroleum, different banks like Bank of America and Citigroup. Business ethics has uh, gotten to much more visibility. Um, it's generally referred to, business ethics generally considered the standards and principles that are used by society to define appropriate and inappropriate conduct in the marketplace or in the workplace. In many cases, these standards have been codified into laws that prohibit certain actions, calling them unacceptable. Uh, society is increasingly demanding that business people behave in a socially responsible manner towards not only the, the customers, but also their employees, to investors, to government regulators, to communities, and even to the natural environment. These are all constraints on free market interactions, if you think about it. We talked earlier about them, but more it's making sure the market doesn't drive things in the wrong direction, get off the rails. No area is more debated online than, uh, than, than online privacy and, and the issues associated with uh, being able to hack different organizations. While one view is that ethics and social responsibility are a good supplement to good business activities, there's an also an alternative viewpoint. Research has shown that ethical behavior could not only enhance a company's reputation, but also, also drive incremental profits because people want to work with organizations that are socially responsible. To promote social responsibility and ethical behavior while achieving organizational goals, businesses can monitor, monitor the changes and the trends in the society's values in their own values internally. They can determine what society wants from them, what individuals in their communities want from them, and attempt to predict the long-term effects of their decisions. A company's reputation depends upon its profit but also the longer term profit will be affected by its ethics and its social responsibility, particularly as the society gets more aware of the interactions between business and society. The next module, module two of this course, will go more deeply into the important concerns and impacts and how the how ethics and social responsibility can be considered and how it might affect one's own career in the workplace and in the businesses that we deal with. That's what will be in the very next, the next lecture or the next module, module two. Please participate in the online discussion about the content of this module that's available on Moodle. Please share your insights on the following questions. What is the fundamental goal of business? Do all organizations share this goal? Who are the main participants in the business environment? What are their main activities? What other factors have an impact on the conduct of business in the United States? Explain the terms supply, demand, equilibrium price, and competition. How, are, how do these forces interact in the American economy? And lastly, list and define the various measures of government and how they may be used to gauge the state of their economies. If unemployment is high, will the growth of GDP be great or will it be small? Thank you for participating in this discussion. I look forward to reading your insights.